It has long been a dream of mine to visit Montana. In this past summer, I finally crossed it off my bucket list, and I planned a week-long camping excursion to Kootenay National Forest. I do a lot of hiking and traveling solo. I only have a few friends, and they aren't interested in the outdoors. Kootenay National Park is one of the wildest places in Montana. It's far in the northwest part of the state, and it butts up against the border with Canada. It was a little tricky to get to, and it involved two flights and a long car ride, but eventually, I made it. I had a map of the park and a rough idea of where I wanted to visit, and where I would make camp each night. It was like some of the more touristy places like Yellowstone and Zion. There's a lot of freedom to set up camp where you want, and basically just explore on your own. The first two days were great. Coming from the city and being able to explore mountains and lakes without another soul in sight was a very liberating experience, and I was dreading going back to the concrete jungle in just a few days. But the third night, I started to experience, well, strange things. I was exhausted after a full day of hiking, and after cooking a freeze-dried dinner, I crawled into my tent just as the sun was going down. My tent was thin, a single-person backpacking model, and it offered no protection except for rain and bugs. Just as I was drifting off to sleep, I heard a heavy thud echo from somewhere deep in the forest. I immediately became alert. The noise continued slowly and monotonously, becoming louder and louder. It sounded like it had come right up to the edge of my camp, maybe 30 yards away. I had my rain fly up and I couldn't see anything, but I didn't dare leave my tent. After about ten minutes of silence, the noise began again, but this time heading away from my camp, until fading away altogether. I stayed awake for hours until I just couldn't fight it anymore, and I eventually passed out. When I awoke, the sun was already high in the sky, and I scrambled to eat breakfast and pack up. Before leaving, I decided to go and investigate the area where I heard the noises last night. What I found set me hard on edge. A print in the hard earth, at least twice the size of a typical man. The prints were deep, whatever it was, and it was heavy. It appeared to have four long curving claws on each foot. I decided it was a good idea to get far away from this spot. I spent a good deal of time outdoors and researching, and I was fairly confident that whatever made these prints was something common to man. I hiked southeast for most of the day, and I settled on a spot near a tiny lake. I hadn't thought to bring any fishing tackle, and I didn't really have any room anyway, so I just let the perfect view wash away the memories from last night. However, things were going to get so much worse. I was still a little wary, and I decided I should stay awake for a few extra minutes, just in case. Sure enough, about twenty minutes after sundown, I heard the slow pounding again. I rushed out of my tent, and I took position about forty feet away behind some bushes. I didn't want to be trapped if that thing came to my camp. The thunderous footfalls continued, getting closer and closer. I was quivering with terror, and I wished I had just kept running. But it was too late now. The thing was too close. It was right at the edge of my camp. The sight before me was more horrifying than I can put into words. The thing was immense. At least 13 or 14 feet tall. It walked on two crooked legs, and flayed skin covered the body with patches of bone showing through. Its rib cage was completely exposed, and its head looked like that of a deer's skull. A single antler sprouted from the right side, the left looking to be broken off at the stump. This time I didn't hesitate. It moved purposely into the middle of my camp and went right for my tent. It took its two heavy claws and ripped the tent open and then reached inside, fishing around for something. Me. After realizing I wasn't in there, the creature let out a series of hoarse shrieks and whistles, like a wounded deer I had once heard. The sound filled the air and seemed to echo on long after it should have. I was too frozen with terror to even think about moving. 
and I just watched as the beast tossed my tent and shredded the few other belongings that I had left in the camp. Its call was answered by the same noise from somewhere far, far to the north. After destroying my camp, the creature lumbered off the way it had come, and the pounding of its heavy feet faded away. I lay still for hours, not able to work up the courage to move. Finally, as the sun began to show itself, I moved into the camp. I was able to salvage my travel documents, but nothing else. The food had been shredded, and my tent was useless. I didn't want to waste any time, and I darted off in the rough direction of where the park's headquarters was. A day later, exhausted and dehydrated, somehow I made it. I guess one of the rangers saw that I was in severe trouble and set me up in a room to rest, because I woke up the next day on a cot with a few scratches and cuts that had been treated. I spoke with one of the rangers and thanked him for his help. I was able to heal up quickly, and I didn't need any serious treatment. I told the ranger about what had happened and what I had seen. When I described the creature, he got a very odd look on his face. Surprise, but not disbelief. He told me it would be best if I kept this to myself. Very few people would believe me, he said. And after thinking about it, I agreed. That was before I stumbled across your channel. After digging around and watching some other videos, it sounds like what I encountered was something called a Wendigo. I don't know if that's what it was or something else. I just know that it stalked me for two days, and if I had been in my tent, well, I wouldn't be writing this. Maybe the wild places in this world just need to stay wild. That's my thought anyway. I'll get straight to it. I think I saw a Mothman last year. My sister was there with me, but she swears up and down that that is not what happened. I think she's avoiding admitting it because she's too scared. But we were both there. We both saw it. And you seem like the best person to share it all with. At least in hopes of me getting some closure. Listening to your channel has really helped me, by the way. It's good to hear I'm not alone with this troubling and unexplainable experience. So, what happened to me was this. Me, my sister Charlotte, and our parents were on vacation. We were staying at our uncle's house near Los Angeles. He lives in a busy area, and there are a lot of new developments going on around his neighborhood. Specifically, He's only a few minutes away from this giant new housing community that's going up. Anyway, Charlotte is a real health nut and she likes to take the dogs and go jogging at night. And I would usually go with her. Sometimes we would jog past the housing development because I thought it was cool. All the frames for the houses and the contracting equipment just sitting around. It was quiet and we always had our phones on, so we felt pretty safe there. We had been doing this routine for a few nights, and it was fun to see the changes that were being completed each day on the buildings. But then, strangely, on the day this happened, I think a random Thursday, the streets were even emptier than usual. Anyway, we were jogging along when all of a sudden our dog stopped in the middle of the sidewalk. He started barking and growling and really straining at the leash, trying to pull us in the direction that he was growling. And he was never like that. He never barks or really misbehaves. So there's me and Charlotte stopped in our tracks and trying to drag him away from whatever has got him freaked out so we can just get him back home. But he's really freaking out. And he's a strong dog, so it's taking both of us and all of our might to keep him in one place and not let him pull himself out of our hands. I followed his line of sight to try to see what was setting him off. And at first, I think he's barking at a house itself. But then I realize he's actually looking above it, up towards the sky. So I look up there, and I can't see anything really, but it's L.A. It's never fully dark, right? I thought maybe he saw a falcon or something that looked like it was too close. But then Charlotte pointed to this black shape. It was circling over the house he was barking at, and it looked huge, even way up there. I couldn't make the details out very well, but as I was looking and trying to make out what it was, it started flying towards us, like it was nosediving towards us, and Baxter started howling. 
Now he was pulling at the lead and trying to drag us towards the thing, and he wasn't giving up on fighting it. I thought for sure we were going to be attacked. This thing was flying fast and right at us, and I realized more and more how massive it was. I can now make out for sure that it didn't look like any kind of animal I have ever seen before, and I also thought I could make out that its eyes were red, and it had this strange pointed head with what looked like this long beak sticking out. And then right as soon as it came to within 20 feet of us, I could feel the wind rushing around us and Baxter was pulling to get at it, standing on his hind legs. And that's when it pulled back up and flew over our head so closely that we could have jumped and touched it. As it crossed over us, everything went black. That's just the enormity of the thing. It was terrifying. And as soon as it passed over us, Charlotte and I made a break for it, screaming at and pulling Baxter. We all ran back to our uncle's house as fast as we could, and I didn't look back the entire run home. Charlotte and I were both really shaken up. Obviously, our parents knew something was wrong, but we just told them that Baxter had almost gotten away from us and that we were just scared from that. Charlotte stopped her evening jogging. She didn't want to be outside at night anymore unless we were in a group or in the city. I couldn't blame her. I, however, was still really curious, and I wanted to figure out what this thing was. So the following night, at about the same time of day, I took my uncle's binoculars and sat myself in a chair in his yard, facing the direction that we had seen it. I sat there for hours. I told my parents I was bird-watching, but really I was curious. I wanted to see that thing again from the safety of the yard, but it didn't appear, though and by that point, the vacation was almost over. Eventually, I had to give up and come back inside. By then, it was too dark anyway. Charlotte still maintains that the creature we saw was some kind of a hawk or a falcon, but I know that she knows that it was much, much bigger than that. I'm still trying to work out what it was, but it really stinks that I can't talk to her about it. She's basically giving me the silent treatment any time I try and ask her, or if I ask her to retell me again how she saw it and how she would describe it. So I guess it's just me with this, and I've been feeling like I want to connect with somebody about it. Hopefully, one of your listeners will have some insights for me. Thank you. Hi, Lilith. I'm just sending you here a quick explanation of something strange that happened to me about five years ago. I was at my friend's house having a bonfire, and we were all sitting around it, relaxing and talking, when something caught our attention. The sky to the west looked like it had been completely lit on fire, but there wasn't any thunder or lightning, just a red glow. We had a really good view of it because this took place in Montana, where the sky is huge and you can see really, really far in every direction. So it seemed like whatever this was would start high in the sky and then move down towards the horizon very quickly. We watched for about 15 minutes as it kept moving up and down repeatedly until it disappeared behind some trees. Now we were at this house all the time, and even after the first night, we would see lights flashing around his property every now and then, but nothing like what we saw that first time. And then... A few months later, he got called into work early one morning. We had all spent the night, and we were all awake, so myself and another friend decided to go out riding ATVs before sunrise, which is common to do here. We went out to a trail that goes through some state land where you can ride pretty much wherever you want. We were about halfway through when we came to a clearing and saw something in the distance that looked like it was on fire, but there wasn't any smoke or smell coming from it just the same red glow as before. It was just hovering above the ground. And then as we were watching, all of a sudden it darted straight up into the sky and it disappeared behind some low-lying clouds. I've never seen a UFO before, but I knew right away that that's what it was. I was sure of it. We had no idea what to do, so we turned around and just went back to his house and didn't talk about it. The next day, my friend who owned the property asked if we saw anything weird out there. And when I told him about it, he said he had seen something like that a few times out in the woods behind his house before, but he never wanted to mention it because it seemed to him that it sounded crazy. He also said that one time he was driving down a gravel road on his property at night and saw lights flashing around him, but didn't see anything causing them. 
After all that, we would see strange things from time to time, but nothing else as crazy as those two incidents. Oh yeah, and one last thing. This guy has been having strange electrical issues with his house for a while now. Lights go on and off by themselves. Appliances turn on when they aren't plugged in, etc., etc. He thought it was just faulty wiring or something like that until he started having issues with his phone, too. His phone would ring, but then there wouldn't be anybody on the other end. Or else a call would hang up without him even answering it. I'm not sure if this is related to what we saw, but those incidents happened around the same time as everything else that we saw and heard. Just wanted to put this out there. Maybe one of your listeners can help us work through this. I used to be able to approach a dog like it was nothing. You know, no second thought, no second guessing myself. Now, though, now I hesitate or I just ignore them completely. It was about three years ago when this happened. Maybe three and a half. Time goes by so fast. I had spent the day with friends playing mud ball. That's just football in the mud and rain. American football, if that helps, since some people think I'm talking about soccer. Anyway, we had played all day, smashing each other into the mud, flying into puddles. It was great fun. It was starting to get dark when we were slowing down. Everyone rehydrated and hung around, shooting the breeze. One team was lording over the other. You know how it goes with guys and sports. Even friendly competitions are fuel for the fire. We can't just help ourselves at times. I had driven with my friend Jeff, and people were beginning to head out to their respective homes. We stayed a little later than most, but eventually we started to walk back to the car. The parking lot was on the other side of the park, so it was a pretty good walk back. Jeff was tossing the ball to himself as we walked, and we were just rehashing the game and all the fun that we had had. People sometimes bring their dogs, too, but most of them do it during the day. The park was pretty empty by now, and we were some of the last to leave. A light rain started to fall, so we walked under the trees to try to keep it off our heads. That's when we first heard, like, a low, howling noise, and we thought that somebody's dog didn't like the rain, or was letting everybody know it. A few minutes later, we saw a dog far off to our left, which I think was West. He was big and black, with long, pointed ears. He was sitting on top of a hill, still as a stone. I thought it was kind of odd, and I told Jeff it looks like he's watching us. We laughed it off and kept walking to the car. We were almost there. I remember my teeth starting to chatter a little from being soaked. We started to get nervous when we walked through this patch of trees, and the black dog was already on the other side. He'd have to have moved pretty fast for that to happen. But he was just sitting at attention, watching us walk to the parking lot. It was odd, but we really didn't think much of it. I mean, it was just a dog, right? About ten minutes later, though, we get to the car, and the dog is there, sitting next to the driver's side door. We both stopped, dead. He didn't make a sound, didn't attempt to move out of the way. He just sat at attention by the door. Jeff and I just looked at each other. We were acting ridiculous, so we started yelling, telling it to go, normal stuff. But it just sat there, stared at us. The weirdest thing was that its eyes seemed to be a bright green. I turned to Jeff and I asked if that was right or not. I'm not a dog expert, but it sure seemed odd to me. He said he knew some dogs could have blue eyes, so he's pretty sure maybe they could have green eyes. This dog's eyes, though, they seemed brighter to me. I don't know. Jeff got the brilliant idea to scare it away with the football. And that's when all hell broke loose. Jeff aimed the ball at the front tire and launched it. The dog bared his teeth and lunged forward at us. We took off. I know you're not supposed to run from an animal chasing you, but we didn't really think about it. We just did it. You could hear the dog snarling and snapping at us from behind, barking its teeth snapping together, and its paws clicking on the concrete. We just kept going until we couldn't run any more, and then we pulled ourselves up into a tree. Now, there was no dog behind us. We looked all around, and we didn't see a thing. But then we heard it howling again, snarling around us, around the tree that we were in. But we couldn't see it. 
It was darker than before, but we should have been able to see it. We didn't see anything around us move unless it was from the light breeze picking up, and then it seemed to get louder, and you could hear the nails of the dog on the tree, but we couldn't see it. And then just like that, everything went silent, dead silent. There were no dog sounds, no birds, nothing. We just sat in the tree, looking around, trying to spot something moving around us. The silence was terrifying. It was like it was alerting us that something was about to happen. How long were we there in the tree? I don't really know. It seemed like a long time, maybe 40 minutes, maybe an hour, just waiting waiting for something to happen. I guess it could have been much shorter, but it seemed like forever to us. It was Jeff who got brave and finally jumped down first. I followed him, and at first we just stood by the tree, watching, waiting. That's when it came at us, rushing out of the brush at us. We took off again. I yelled to head for the parking lot. My chest was about to explode. I've never run so fast. It hurt to even breathe, and I was getting really tired. I hit the button to unlock the car on my key ring, and I pulled open the driver's side door as fast as I could. I did the same to shut it behind me. Jeff did the same, but that didn't stop the dog. The dog slammed into the car, barking, snarling, drooling, jumping up and down on the door and on the hood, its nails digging into the paint. And then suddenly, it was gone, like a blink, and it disappeared. I turned and looked at Jeff. He looked at me. I started the car and took off like a bat out of hell. People tell me it was probably a stray with rabies or something, and that's why it was so aggressive. I don't know, though. There was something about that night, that dog, something else that I can't explain, at least not with the reality that I know. I'm gun-shy around dogs now. We've been back a few times to the park. Nothing like that's ever happened again. Maybe it was just a dog with rabies but I'm not sure. I guess most people remember their first job, but I bet they don't remember it for the same reason I remember mine. In 10th grade, I started working the cash register at a local pizza place. I gradually worked my way up to making the pizzas. And then when I turned 18, they let me start making the deliveries. That was fun because I got to get out of the restaurant and explore different neighborhoods around Oxford, Mississippi. I also got to keep the tips, which came in handy after I graduated and started attending college. Truthfully, I probably would have stayed at that job until I got my degree if it hadn't been for that one experience that changed my life. As much as I try, I can't erase the memory of that night and this is the first time that I've been able to go into detail about what I witnessed. I've told a few friends and family members that I had a frightening experience on a delivery, but I know that if I told them the full truth, they would never believe me. Over the past few weeks, though, I've done a little research online, and I found out that other people have had similar experiences, so I figured this would be a safe place to share my story. It was the last delivery of the night, and the customer lived right at the edge of town. Another quarter of a mile, and he would have been out of our delivery zone. The sky was pitch black, and there wasn't any street lights. There was just a faint bulb burning on the guy's porch. And by the time I got back to my car, I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. I was happy to be back behind the wheel, and I started driving back towards the restaurant. But just a couple of minutes down the road, I heard a loud pop and I realized that I had run over something that punctured one of my tires. This was the first time I'd ever had a flat tire, and I didn't know the first thing about how to change it. I pulled off under the shoulder and started to panic a little bit. It was the worst place to have an emergency. I could barely see anything around me, and I was still about four miles from the restaurant. Mind you, this was right when cell phones were just starting to become popular, and I didn't have one. So instead of trying to change a tire for the first time ever in the dark, I figured my best bet would be to try to walk back towards work. Luckily, I had a flashlight in the trunk, so I could at least see a few feet in front of me as I began the journey. After a big truck nearly hit me, I decided to move away from the shoulder of the road and walk a bit deeper into the brush. There were a few trees, but nothing crazy. 
I figured I would just keep going in the same general direction and eventually end up at the restaurant. But a couple of minutes later, I heard some ruffling in the leaves just ahead of me. I told myself it was nothing to worry about, maybe just something falling from one of the trees. But then I heard it again, only much louder and closer. I slowly moved the beam of my flashlight up from the ground, and I initially saw a pair of hind legs that looked a lot like they could have belonged to my parents' German shepherd. At first, I considered that it might be a stray dog, and I was a little bit relieved. I always loved dogs. But then I kept moving the light higher, and I realized that these legs were way bigger than any normal dog. This monster was walking upright and by the time a flashlight got to its head, I knew that this wasn't any animal I had ever seen before. It had to have been pushing eight feet tall. I was close to six feet, and it towered over me. Its mangy brown fur covered an enormous head, and it seemed to have a thousand teeth coming out of its long, pointed snout. Worst of all were its eyes. They seemed to glow red in the dark, and they reminded me of images that I had seen of what people think demons look like. And then I got a whiff of its stench. I don't know whether it was more like stale urine or garbage that had been sitting out in the hot sun, but it was disgusting either way. This thing then let out a vicious-sounding growl and jumped towards me. It must have moved more than a yard with one leap, and then it seemed like it was close enough to reach out and touch. Of course, I wasn't about to try to touch it. All of this happened in just a few seconds, but it felt like the encounter lasted a lifetime. I finally got control of my senses, and I took off running back towards the road. I heard the rustling leaves and a few more growls, but I didn't dare look back to see how close it was. I never ran faster than I did that night, even when I was on the high school track team. My feet didn't slow down until I got back into town and I fell down at the door of the restaurant. I was out of breath and exhausted when my manager came to check on me. She asked what was wrong, and I didn't know what to tell her. Instead of getting into the details, I just told her about the flat tire, and I said I got spooked on the way back. She was very helpful, and she even called her husband, who offered to change my tire for me. As much as I loved that job, though, I just couldn't shake the feeling that I could possibly run into that creature in the woods again. The next day, I turned in my two weeks' notice and refused to go out on any more deliveries. To this day, I still haven't been back to that side of town, and I don't think I'll be headed there anytime soon. My initials are R.M., and that's all I'm going to share with you on my identity, by the way. I'm writing this report in order to try to get help from whatever entity may be able to aid me in my time of need. It all started in 2020 in Jasper County, South Carolina, where I live. I had been hearing strange howls and other noises for a while at that point, but at the time, I didn't realize what I had been hearing. I only figured it out in retrospect. So, anyway, one night, I was laying in bed watching TV, and in the distance, I was also listening to the barking. But there was also strange screams at the same time that night. I got up from my bed to listen closer because it felt like something bad might be happening outside, and I didn't feel right not to check. So I got up and I went outside to investigate these noises further. Once outside, I now could hear the noises more clearly than ever before. It was almost like they were calling me to come closer. Like, I swear I could hear voices in my head telling me that. But of course, I had no interest in following them. But I did feel safe just checking around the yard, so I took a walk around and behind the house. We have a lot of land there, and the house is about a mile from the nearest road because we have a really long driveway. After taking only a few steps, I heard something coming towards me from out of the nearby woods. The woods surrounded my home on all sides, except for where there was a small opening to the main road that connected to the driveway. Anyway, after hearing the noise, I stopped, and I listened. I kept hearing these howls and screams growing closer and closer, until finally this dog-looking thing jumped out from behind a tree 
and started running directly towards me. Within seconds, I was literally just feet away from this thing, and it stopped dead in its tracks. I could clearly see its face now, which was wrinkled like an old man's, but with these large fangs where regular teeth would be. I slowly reached around for my pocket knife that was clipped to my pants, but even though I knew that a tiny little knife was no match for this creature, I felt better than having nothing at all. Anyway, the thing then lunged at me and tried to swipe at me with its claws, which I felt were like ten inches long. Luckily for me, I was able to move out of the way in time, and I swiped back with my knife. I didn't hit it, but I think it was enough to get it to back off, because it paused for a second and I was able to then turn around and run. But as I ran back to the house, I swear that that thing was right behind me. I mean, it sounded like its breath was only inches from my ear. I sprinted towards home without looking backwards, and I just kept running until I tripped over something and fell face first under the ground. At this point, my adrenaline was sky high, and I picked myself back up. I ran into my house, I slammed the door shut, locked it, and then just collapsed against my front door in a puddle of sweat. I fell to the floor and I laid there for ten minutes or something, making sure that there were no more sounds before I finally got up again. I decided to go back outside to double-check everything, but this time I took my rifle. I don't think it would have done me much good, because I heard once that these creatures can't be brought down with bullets. But I don't know if that's true or not. Anyway, I wandered around the yard for a bit, and the sounds had all but gone away. I figured that it must have gotten bored of messing with me and maybe went on its way, so I decided to just head back inside. I started walking back towards my house for the second time that night when suddenly the thing came crashing towards me again. But this time, it wasn't headed towards me. This time, I watched as a second creature just like it was chasing after it. I watched as the two of them ran past me and off into the woods. And even stranger was that these things looked like they were fighting or something, because they were both snarling and growling at each other as if they wanted to rip each other apart. They ran off and disappeared back into the forest beyond the house. Once again, I made it inside without any harm done except a few cuts and bruises from the initial encounter. I'm not sure why those things didn't kill me or hurt me. And who knows what was going on between the two of them. All I know is that these creatures do exist. And they could be watching me, or you, any of us, at this very moment. I'm very curious now when I go outside, and I don't really wander around out there in the dark anymore. But I do know that these things are out there in the shadows. And I think they're just waiting for another opportunity to attack. I was staying with my grandmother after she had an operation on her knee. To be honest, she probably should have been in assisted living, but she was always a pretty independent lady, and she wanted to stay that way as long as possible. She could still take care of herself and was in her right mind most of the time. I say most of the time because she would randomly say things that made no sense, but then she would act completely normal the rest of the day. She was going to need a little help after her operation. So instead of getting a caretaker for her, I took some time off work and elected to stay over and help her out. I should note that my grandmother lived in an older house set deep in the woods of rural Georgia. Her father built the house, and she ended up with it after her parents died. None of her siblings wanted it, but she felt attached to it, and she lived there ever since. We used to visit in the summer months when school was out, but there were very strict rules. One of the big rules one of the rules you dared never break, was that no one was to leave the yard. We could play on the mowed grass, but as soon as the grass turned to weeds, we were not allowed past it, and we would be reprimanded if we ever set foot in the forest. Back then, I thought Grandma was just worried we would get lost in the woods, but as I would come to learn, it wasn't that at all. She wasn't worried about us getting lost. She was worried about us getting taken. You see, there is something that lives out there in those woods. Something evil. I don't think anybody quite knows what the creature is, but there have been sightings and stories of these things all over the world. People just don't like to talk about them. The locals learn to live with them. 
It was my first night there after Grandma had been released from the hospital. I had forgotten something in my car, and I went out to get it. It was about eight o'clock at night and was getting dark. My grandma heard me open the front door and screamed for me to shut it. I told her that I was just going to my car, but she said wait until morning. My car was only 30 feet from the door. I could see it out the window. I figured she was just on one of her weird tangents again, or maybe a little loopy from the painkillers. I told her that I would be fine and that I would be back in a minute or less. She stopped me before I went out the door and said, don't follow the lights. Don't follow the voices. It was weird, but that was normal for her. She would say weird things like that all the time. Things that made no sense, or things I thought made no sense. I assured her that I would only be gone a minute or less and that everything would be fine. And then I headed out to my car. It was dark out, but I could see enough of the surrounding area by the porch light. I unlocked my car, and the headlights turned on, lighting the driveway even more. I wasn't worried, not even in the slightest. I was digging in the passenger side of my car, looking for whatever thing I had forgotten. I can't even remember what it was at this point, or why it was so important. But suddenly, I had the feeling that I was being watched. I felt fine just a second ago, but now I felt odd. Like there was something wrong, but I didn't know what. Something told me to look up. It was like that feeling you get when you think somebody is following you and you suddenly turn around. That was the feeling that I had. I looked up, and in the forest I saw what looked like lights. I counted six of them. Tiny golden lights all in a row. I was focused on the lights in front of me trying to figure out what they were when I had that feeling again. The feeling that I need to turn around and look at something behind me. And so I did. And there were lights behind me, too. Another line of lights. I spun around, and they were everywhere. I didn't know what to think. I had no idea what they were. I then heard my grandma banging on the window, yelling at me to come back inside. I saw the lights in the forest directly in the line of the headlights of my car. They weren't there a moment ago, but they were there now. I turned on my high beams to see if I could get a glimpse of what was out there. And I was horrified. The golden lights. They were eyes. Dozens and dozens of eyes. I couldn't get a good look at the creature, but I saw it well enough to never want to see it again. It looked almost human. Almost. It was ghoulish. It had pale skin, nearly gray in color. Its body was angular and bony, and it had arms and legs like a human, but it was sitting hunched over. I couldn't see its face very well, but I did see that its nose was just a hole in its head and it looked almost like a skull. I ran back inside the moment I realized what I was looking at. I was shaking when I slammed the door behind me. I could barely catch my breath. My grandma said, I told you not to go out there. I couldn't get much information out of her regarding the creatures. She told me never to go out at night and never go in the forest, day or night. She also told me that they can mimic voices, and if I hear someone in the forest asking for help, don't follow them. I asked what they wanted with us, but she couldn't, or rather, wouldn't give me an answer. She just said that as long as I followed the rules, I wouldn't have to worry. What I'm about to share with you took place in the summer of 2017. A young man went missing in Yellowstone National Park. This was not the first time this had happened but it was different from many of the other cases in a few ways. For one thing, the missing person has yet to be found nearly 15 years later. Secondly, he was my friend. Yellowstone is a huge park, and it's easy to get lost in the wilderness. It's also easy to fall and hurt yourself, or even get attacked by a wild animal. I mean, the park is full of grizzly bears, wolves, and mountain lions. It's easy to see how someone could go missing there, but without a trace, at all, for this long, that's the scary part. Over the years, some people started suggesting that he had been killed by a wild animal. Others said he must have gotten lost and died of exposure or eaten by wildlife, but there was no evidence to support any of those stories. I mean, not even his backpack or clothing was found. And then one day, 
it surfaced on an online chat. Someone started posting that he might have been killed by an unidentified creature, and the chat site exploded. Apparently, there was an eyewitness that came to the authorities soon after my friend disappeared, and they said that they had been in the area the day of the disappearance. The eyewitness said that he heard a noise while hiking, one that sounded like a large animal wailing in a way that he had never heard before, and then he followed the noise to see what it was. After about a hundred yards, he rounded a bend in the trail, and he saw a creature resembling a black panther. That's what he called it, up ahead of him. He could only see it from behind, so he couldn't identify the creature by its facial features. And beyond the creature, the eyewitness could see a lone male hiker, who I wholeheartedly think was my friend based on the description. The hiker was standing there and facing back at the creature. This man stated that he felt sure that the creature was striking a pose to attack the hiker. The eyewitness was too scared to approach the situation or yell out, afraid that he would become the target, and so he decided to rush back, find a ranger, and report what he had seen and where. But it turns out that the authorities didn't seem to believe the account, and from what he knows, they never followed up on it. He said they were polite and took notes, but they didn't seem surprised or even interested at all. The eyewitness has now also shared that he basically felt bullied into not talking about it. But after 15 years, he felt the need to share with the public what he saw. After that, additional accounts of creature encounters continued to surface online. People started posting that they too had seen a similar creature in Yellowstone. In many cases, these people described the creature as being big and hairy, with sharp claws and teeth. Most people also say that the creature is bipedal and stands about seven feet tall. They say it's covered in dark hair and has a long, protruding snout. Witnesses say that it emits a foul smell. Some describe the smell as rotting meat, and others liken it to sulfur and eggs that have gone bad. People wholeheartedly said that what they saw was definitely not a bear. They're 100% convinced that it was something else. Could it have been a Sasquatch? Some even suggested a werewolf. But there was no pattern in the sightings to help identify it. And they all happened at all times of day, at all times of year. Some people say that the Yellowstone creature is just a myth. But I don't know. I'm not sure what to believe anymore. All I know is that my friend is likely still out there, somewhere in the park, in some form or another, and it looks like he's not coming back. I'm now super aware of any news about Yellowstone, and I can tell you that there have been numerous reports of creature encounters in the park. Many of them are quite strange. Some people believe that there are multiple creatures lurking in the park, and that the group of them, or the pack, or whatever it would be called, is what's responsible for the complete disappearances over the years. Park officials continue to deny the existence of any such creature, but they've never been able to provide a rational explanation for the disappearances either. If you think about it, that land has been there for millions of years, and the creature is just roaming around until now? It just doesn't make sense. I think they've been there much longer than us, and they're just waiting for us to leave. Or they're trying to chase us out and getting rid of those who get too close. I think they do it all so that they can get their land back. Of course, there are others who say that the creature is the result of a genetic experiment gone wrong, or that it's related to the chupacabra, but nobody knows for sure. The only thing that we know is that people have disappeared over the years and there doesn't seem to be anything anybody can do about it. So, as for my friend, the mystery of him missing in Yellowstone has not been solved to this day, and there's not a shred of evidence as to what happened to him. At least, there's nothing at all that makes sense. Honestly, I'm now starting to think that it's a mystery that may never be solved. If you're ever in Yellowstone National Park, I beg of you to be careful and stay on the trails, because you never know 
who might disappear next. I'm not a park ranger, but my father was. He passed away late last year. He would tell me stories of being a park ranger at Mount Rainier. He was a wildlife ranger for over 20 years. I grew up in Graham, Washington, a small town just southeast of Tacoma. My mom is still a teacher at Frontier Middle School. We spent most weekends outdoors hiking and camping. He told me how his job was to protect the wildlife in the park. He also worked to educate people about leave-no-trace principles and how to enjoy the wilderness safely. My father always had a love for nature, and he instilled that in me. I remember going on hikes with him when I was younger and learning about all the different plant and animal species we would encounter. He taught me how to identify animal tracks and scat, and how to properly store food so that bears couldn't get to it. I even got to help him set up bear-proof containers in some of the campgrounds. I miss my father dearly, but I'm so grateful for the time we had together and for all the lessons that he taught me. He always had some great stories to tell, and one of my favorites was when he rescued two lost hikers. They had gotten turned around on the Wonderland Trail, and they ended up in an area of the park that was closed off to visitors. The Wonderland Trail is 93 miles long and goes all the way around Mount Rainier. It's a strenuous hike with a lot of elevation gain and loss. It goes through lowland forests and valleys, and into high alpine areas. Hikers can often go beyond their skill level and overestimate what they're capable of. My father found the hikers and got them to medical attention right away. They were severely dehydrated and hypothermic. If he hadn't found them when he did, they probably wouldn't have made it through the night. My dad always made sure that I knew how to stay safe in the wilderness, and his stories always helped drive that point home. Before he passed, he told me of an encounter that he had that absolutely terrified him. Let me just say that if you know my dad, you wouldn't think anything would terrify him. He's an ex-Marine, ex-cop, and park ranger. But this one incident definitely shook him up. He was working in Longmire Meadow one afternoon, checking on a beaver pond that had been built. As he was walking around the pond, he heard a loud splash behind him. It sounded like a grizzly running through the shallow end of the pond, he thought. But when he turned around, he could see the water was disturbed and was rippling across the pond, but there was no animal. Longmire Meadow is a pretty open area near the beaver pond, so whatever animal splashed in the water had to cover a significant amount of ground before disappearing into the woods. He said it was the strangest thing he ever experienced. The next day, he was talking to one of the other park rangers, and they told him that 15 years prior, a man had gone missing in that area. They said his body was never found, but his car was found abandoned near Longmire Meadow. The man was related to one of the park rangers and was a very experienced hiker. He knew better than to go off into the wilderness without letting somebody know where he was going. The search party looked for him for weeks, but never found any trace. The only thing they found was his car with the key still in the ignition. My father was a little weirded out after hearing the story, but more curious than anything. A few days later, he was out in Longmire Meadow again, and this time his senses were on high alert, considering what happened the last time. He looked around but saw nothing out of the ordinary, but then he heard the sound of twigs snapping, like something heavy was moving through the woods towards him. He turned around and saw this large, dark figure standing near the edge of the woods. It definitely wasn't a bear, and it wasn't anything he had ever seen before. The figure was taller than a man and covered in fur. He radioed into the ranger's office for backup with his location. He yelled towards the figure, but it didn't move. At this point, it was about 75 yards from where he was, but the visibility wasn't great. He knew it was too large to be a man but he couldn't get a good view of its features. It was near the edge of the woods, and there was some brush that was covering it up, at least covering part of its body. From what he could see, it had very long arms, longer than a human, and those arms hung down past its knees. And that's when he realized that this thing was standing on two legs like a human, but it definitely wasn't a human. He said everything in the moment was very quiet, like it was only him and this creature that existed. He was terrified, 
but he had his weapon on him in case anything progressed. He took his eyes off the creature for a second when he heard the backup ranger pull up in his vehicle, but by the time he turned back around, it was gone. He didn't know what to make of it, neither did the other ranger. They both agreed that it sounded like something that shouldn't exist. My dad was always extra cautious when he had to go out to Longmire Meadow from that day forward, although he never encountered this creature again. Two of his colleagues did. The next season, a seasonal park ranger had a similar encounter in Longmire Meadow. However, he watched it run into the woods. The movement and the speed at which the creature moved was frightening, he said. And then two years later, another wilderness ranger encountered a strange dark figure at the edge of the woods near Bench Lake, and that's about seven miles from Longmire Meadow. This ranger was able to get a better look at the creature and described it as being covered in black fur with yellowish eyes. This ranger was pretty shaken up about the encounter and had to take a few days off. There's a small handful of rangers who have encountered these sightings while my father was working at Mount Rainier but it's something that he never told me until later in life. I'm not sure why, but it's terrifying to think that these creatures exist. Growing up in the Pacific Northwest, I've had encounters with grizzly bears before, and it's pretty terrifying. I've even had one charge at me and my father when we were hiking Rampart Ridge. I wanted to share this story so that people will be aware of the possibility that these creatures really do exist. I've seen one. Please be careful if you're out in the woods and make sure to let somebody know where you're going. This happened outside my hometown of Albany, New York on Father's Day weekend. It had been a very long time since my family had been together at one time and in one place. My siblings and I had scattered once we took jobs and got married. My dad was the main anchor of our family and unfortunately had been diagnosed with cancer that spring, so we all decided to have a big party for him for Father's Day. He didn't know we were all coming together for it, and it was intended to be a surprise. I was driving to the cabin because I didn't care for planes much, and at the time this happened, I wasn't living too far away, just a state away in Scranton, Pennsylvania. My mom asked if I'd be okay to drive up to the cabin a few days in advance to set up the place, get it cleaned and set up with party streamers and things like that. Since I lived the closest other than my mom and dad, I agreed to head up on Friday night. I had gotten into the state a little after 6 p.m., but I needed to drive an hour or two more before I would actually reach the cabin. I ended up stopping in a suburban area close to where I grew up. I needed gas and a snack, but my mom said, be careful that somebody we know doesn't see me, like the nosy neighbors. She didn't want the surprise to be ruined, so I raced inside, paid for everything, and left. When I got back on the road, I regretted my stop. For some reason, it seemed to have made me more tired than I expected. I'd been driving for a few hours, and I was alone, so getting sleepy. But I knew that I was almost there, and that helped a little. Also, I was excited to see everybody. I turned some music on and started trying to sing along so I wouldn't fall asleep. It was weird being back in town without seeing anybody. I felt sort of like a ghost in a way, and I think that it made the night a little more eerie, feeling like you're a ghost in your own town. I really wanted to see my cousin, too, so she promised to meet me at the cabin the following day. And then I started getting towards the edge of town. I knew when I was going over the creek because of this strange bump and weird, uneven feeling of the bridge. The bridge didn't have a top or anything like that, so in the dark, unless you knew it was there, there wouldn't be any sign of it except the sensation of you being bounced around in the car. There were also lots of trees at this point, and houses were becoming scarce, but I'd still see one every now and then. And then as I got closer to eight o'clock, I knew I was only a half an hour away from the cabin and the road there started to get a bit more intense. There were a lot more twists and turns at this point. I'd been to the cabin several times as a kid, but I didn't remember the road being this crazy. I'm a nervous driver, though, so I needed to take things slower than the average person. I started to turn around this bend in the road, and my headlights were a bit dim, so I turned on my brights. As soon as I did this, I could have sworn I saw something on one of the trees. 
It reminded me of the glare in an animal's eyes. You know, like a cat in the dark. Their eyes shine different colors like green, orange, and white. And that's similar to what I saw. I assumed it was an animal, maybe a cat. Maybe that's why its eyes were shining like that. But whatever it was, it wasn't terribly big, but it wasn't small either. Honestly, that first glimpse wasn't much of a shock, but it was strange, I guess. I didn't think much of it and continued to drive. I followed another bend in the road, but then I saw it again, this time more clearly, and it was pale. It didn't appear to have any hair. What I could see was simply a creature with pale skin, like translucent, and it was hanging off the trunk of the tree. It reminded me of a kind of a chimp or a monkey or something, probably because it had these long fingers and toes. The thing stood out so prominently from the tree because of its pale skin, so I could easily see that the fingers and toes seemed to wrap around the tree. Not completely, but enough to make it look like it was suctioned to the tree. And its eyes, they were glowing, but this time I knew it was not a cat. I would say it was the size of a small child. I wish I could tell you about its face, but I couldn't really see it all that much. It was mostly blocked by the tree's trunk, but it was sort of sticking out like it was looking out towards me. I started to freak out. I wasn't sure if this thing was following me or if there was more than one of them or what it was doing. I just knew that I did not feel comfortable, and I was well aware of the fact that I was all alone. I didn't want to stop the car, so I raced through the trees to the cabin. I didn't bother to focus where my headlights were shining because I was so scared that I would see it again, but I didn't. When I pulled into the driveway of the cabin, I immediately grabbed my cell phone and I dialed my mom's number before I even went inside. I told her what happened. I was hysterical, and the experience ended up ruining my dad's surprise because I just couldn't stand the thought of being there alone. And so I left, and I headed to their house without decorating or getting ready for the party. Needless to say, my dad was thrilled to see me. And then the family did all convene for the party, me too but it was no longer a surprise and there were no decorations set up in advance. We all still had a great time and enjoyed the day, and there were no further sightings of that creature. Father's Day turned out good in the end, but I will never go to that cabin again. Please let me know if you think you know what I saw. I'm an amateur photographer and nature enthusiast always on the lookout for new and exciting things to capture on camera. This particular adventure took place in the dense forests of the Appalachian Mountains, where I had heard rumors of strange and unexplained sightings. I was excited to explore the area, but little did I know that I was about to enter something that would change my perspective on the unexplained forever. As an avid hiker and camper, I had always been drawn to the Appalachian Mountains. I'd heard whispers of unusual sightings and stories of creatures that lurked in the woods, but I'd never encountered anything that I couldn't explain. That was, until my latest trip. It was a crisp autumn morning when I first caught sight of it. Unlike anything I had ever seen, a creature was perched on a nearby tree branch. It was about the size of a large dog, but its features were distinctly simian, with sharp claws and piercing eyes that seemed to bore into my soul. It looked like something out of a horror movie, and I was terrified. Despite my fear, my curiosity got the best of me, and I decided to investigate. I slowly approached the creature, camera in hand, trying to get a better look. But as I got closer, it suddenly leaped from the branch and disappeared into the dense underbrush. I was left alone, with my heart racing and unsure of what to do next. Over the next few days, I saw the creature several more times, but always from a distance. It seemed to be watching me, almost studying me. I began to feel like I was being stalked by some wild animal, but this was no ordinary beast. This thing was intelligent and cunning, and it seemed to be almost human-like in its behavior. I confided in my spouse about what I had seen, but she was skeptical, chalking it up to my overactive imagination. That was until she saw the creature for herself. We both knew that we had to figure out what was going on. As the days passed, the sightings became more frequent, and the creature became more brazen. 
It would come right up to our campsite, making eerie noises and awful screeches that echoed through the forest. We knew we had to get to the bottom of this before it was too late. Our fear and anxiety were at an all-time high. We didn't know what this creature was capable of or what it wanted from us. The constant fear of the unknown was starting to wear on us, and we knew we had to find answers. One night, we were woken up by a loud scratching on the side of our tent. We could hear the creature snarling and growling just outside, and we knew that it was trying to get in. We were terrified, but lucky that the creature eventually gave up and disappeared into the night. We decided we had to leave the area to seek help. We spent weeks researching and talking to locals, trying to uncover the truth behind the creature's identity. We finally came across an old legend that described a creature known as the Devil Monkey. We couldn't believe what we were reading, but it all made sense. According to our research, the Devil Monkey was a mischievous creature that liked to torment and scare humans. It was said to have razor-sharp claws and teeth, and it was known to be fiercely territorial. We learned that the devil monkey had been seen in the Appalachian Mountains for generations, but that sightings had become less frequent in recent years. Some believed that the creature was nothing more than a myth, but we now knew it was real. Armed with our newfound knowledge, we were able to finally confront the devil monkey. We set up a trap using food as bait, and after several tense hours of waiting, the creature finally appeared. We were able to capture it on camera, and it was a surreal experience to finally see the creature up close and photograph it. After our encounter with the devil monkey, we decided to leave the area and return home. We'd accomplished our goal of uncovering the truth, and we knew that we had to share our experiences with others. We reported our findings to local authorities and animal experts, but oddly, it never seemed to gain traction or catch anybody's attention. The experience has been both terrifying and exhilarating. It changed us forever. We were now believers in the unexplained, and we also now knew that there was so much more out there waiting to be discovered. Our encounter with the devil monkey opened a new world of possibilities for us. We began to seek out other unexplained phenomena. Looking back on our encounter with the devil monkey, we realized how lucky we were to have survived. We'd been in the presence of a wild and unpredictable creature, and we knew that we had to respect its power and intelligence. Our experience had shown us that there was so much more to the world than what we could ever see. I was driving a logging truck on a project in northeastern British Columbia. It was an extremely remote area. If I'm honest, it was a little creepy if you had to drive the logging road at night. It felt like driving through a tunnel of trees, like the trees were going to reach out and grab you. It took a while to get used to. The native stories about the area didn't help either. I knew some First Nation guys who wouldn't set foot in these forests, but I was never one to believe stuff like that. The biggest problem I had was deer. That's what I was afraid of. The forest was so dense that you couldn't see them standing in the shadows at the edge of the road. We had elk and moose up here, too, but they seemed to keep off the road for the most part. The deer, on the other hand, would jump out right at your truck. I knew there were other animals out there in the woods, like bears and wolves, animals you definitely didn't want to run into, animals that were dangerous. But there's something else that lives out there with them, something only found in the very far north of Canada. The local First Nations tribe called it a medicine bear. It was said to have sacred spiritual powers, and seeing one was extremely rare, and either very lucky or unlucky, depending on who you talked to. I heard other stories calling it a ghost, a spirit from an ancient past, some poor creature that was long dead and lost in time. They said it couldn't be killed. People have claimed to shoot it, only to have the bullet pass straight through, as if the animal itself wasn't real. The creature would then just look at them and not even flinch. I never heard any stories of it attacking somebody, but there was always a hint of danger to the tales. A few people were convinced it was some prehistoric creature that somehow survived undetected in that remote north of Canada. And after working up there for a while, 
I wouldn't be at all surprised that an ancient species managed to stay hidden for thousands of years. The forests are so remote that they're barely accessible to humans. Just beyond the area we were logging was a huge national park reserve that was only reachable by bush plane. There were very, very few people around, if any. After seeing the creature myself, I know what my theory is, but I'll let you decide for yourself. I was driving back along the logging road. It had taken a bit longer to load the trailer than I had planned, so I was stuck driving the road at night. The headlights illuminated the way directly in front of me, but I felt engulfed in darkness. I don't know why, but the night always felt darker out here. Maybe it was the lack of light pollution or the cover of the trees surrounding the road. Either way, it was unsettling to say the least. I was always looking out for deer, and that night one of my worst fears came true. I never saw them at the edge of the road. It was just too dark. Two of the deer made it across the road, but I plowed right into the third. Luckily, it wasn't a big enough impact to cause me to lose control. I stopped the truck as soon as I was able to investigate the damage. I cursed the deer for being so stupid. There was no way they didn't hear my truck or see the headlights. But of course, they had to run out right in front of me. But then I heard something moving through the forest behind me. It was quiet, but there was definitely something out there. And then I realized that the three deer that ran out in front of me weren't being suicidal at all. They were being chased. And I saw by what? I saw it walk out into the road. I shined my flashlight at it. It looked at me briefly, acknowledging my existence, but it didn't seem to care. It was focused on the deer that lay dead in the ditch. Now, I'm not exaggerating when I say this thing was the size of a horse. It was bigger than any bear I had ever seen, and its fur was solid white and shaggy, and it had the head of what looked like a wolf, but it was more blocky, and its muzzle was wider, like some sort of cross between a wolf and a bear. It walked on its toes like a wolf did, but its shoulders were significantly higher than its hips. There was an angle to its hind legs, too, that was dog-like. Think of a hyena, and that's kind of what it moved like. I could see how people mistook it for both a wolf and a bear, but it was actually something in the middle. The creature had no interest in me at all. Its only focus was the dead deer. It walked across the road and into the ditch and began tearing open the deer. I watched it for a moment, having a hard time believing what I was seeing in front of me. This was definitely the animal from the stories, but what exactly was it? I had no idea. I don't think it was a ghostly spirit, or why would it need to eat? I don't think it was some sort of evil monster, either. It didn't try to attack me. It acted like a wild animal looking for an easy meal. I don't know how our encounter would have gone if the dead deer wasn't in the ditch. But then again... The incident with the deer was the entire reason I was standing there outside my truck in the first place. I didn't tell anyone what I saw up there. There were a few guys I worked with that would have taken the opportunity to hunt the beast, hoping to capture some sort of mythical trophy, just for the sake of killing. Did the creature look dangerous? Oh, yes, but I didn't think it wanted much to do with humans. I was standing outside next to it with only a flashlight and it didn't try to attack me, even though I was near its food, so I decided to keep it secret. I won't disclose the exact area I saw it, but it was very far north, so far north that something like that could remain hidden for who knows how long, and probably still is. I've got to tell you this story that happened to me. It's all true. All of the stories. I know because I've seen that creature that people talk about on your channel. I can hardly believe it. I never thought I would be telling you something about one. Anyway, since my boyfriend Alex died, I just up and sold my house. I couldn't stand to live there anymore. So I bought a used little camper trailer, and I traded my car for a pickup to haul it. I've been traveling around since, and I've seen a lot of stuff, but nothing like what I saw on the way to Memphis, Tennessee. I wanted to go to Graceland because Alex always wanted to go there, and we never did. Stuff always got in the way, money or whatever. 
I decided to camp at Neiman Shelby Forest State Park. The guy at the visitor center looked like Paul Bunyan or something. A big beard, hat, flannel shirt, the whole deal. Since it was November, the park was pretty empty. It wasn't that cold, but people might have been getting ready for Thanksgiving. I don't know. Paul Bunyan took forever putting something in his computer, and then he said, You know, I just want to tell you that apparently there have been a lot of dogman sightings around. At least, that's what people are calling it, just so you know. I thought for sure he was messing with me, so I didn't say anything. I just wanted my campsite assignment. I was tired from driving all day. If you're scared, I can get you a cabin. It's probably safer, he said. I don't know anything about a dogman, I told him. People say it's only in Michigan, but I don't believe that, he said. They also say you only see it in years ending in seven, but I don't believe that either. I was getting sick of it at this point, and I said, well, what do you believe? Me? I think a dogman's prowling around the area here. I think it's hungry, maybe. How do you know? I asked him. I heard it howl. It doesn't sound like a wolf or a coyote. It sounds different, he said. I don't know what he meant by that, but I decided not to ask. And then he said, Are you sure you want to be out here by yourself? There's nobody camping today. They're just in the cabins. I do have a cabin you can have. Well, my money was pretty strict, and I knew I didn't have enough for a cabin, so I told him, No, just let me have the campsite. He shrugs and said, Suit yourself. Then he circles my site on a paper map and hands it to me. I drove over to the site and put the blocks under the trailer. It's a teardrop, so I didn't have much other setting up to do. Since it was cold, I just heated up some soup in the microwave and I sat at the table to eat. I didn't hear anything except the usual forest sounds. Bugs, birds, squirrels. I was tired, so I got into my little trailer bed early and I fell asleep pretty quickly. I didn't hear anything all night. In the morning, it was so cold, so I stayed inside for a bit, making some pancakes from one of those shake and pour mixes. I drank some coffee, and I read my Memphis tour guide. I decided to hike around the park before leaving, but when I got out of the trailer, something told me to check my truck. I walked over to look at it, and one of the tires, the one on the side of the woods, not the side of the road, was completely flat. I got down to look closer, and I saw this ragged part, as if something had ripped it or chewed on the tire. Now that was impossible, though, because nothing could have jaws powerful enough to chew a tire, except a dinosaur, maybe. Something huge, anyway. But there it was. Whatever it was had teeth strong enough to puncture a tire. The hole wasn't that big, but like I said, the part around it looked chewed, frayed. I wasn't going anywhere until I got that fixed, but it was still pretty early, so I decided to go on the hike first. Maybe I would somehow figure out an answer while I was out there. While I was walking, I saw a few tracks that could have been from a dog, but I couldn't be sure. They were too big, though, I thought. Like, as big as my shoe. And no dog is that big. I decided to hike to the park office to see if Paul Bunyan was there. He was, so I told him I needed the name of a car repair shop. I told him something chewed a hole in my tire. He acted as if that was totally normal and gave me a phone number. He didn't react in any other way. Weird dude. So I called the number and I just told the guy who answered that I needed a tire fixed. He said he could send a tow over. When I got off the phone, Paul Bunyan was staring at me. His actual name was Jeb, according to his name tag. Dogman, he said. Bit your tire. No way, I told him. He shrugged. Finally, the tow came and towed my truck. I rode along with them to the shop in the front seat. In total silence, mind you. But when the guy was done fixing the tire, he said, What happened to the tire? I told him the guy at the park thinks it's a dogman. He says, Put out some dog treats tonight and see if he eats them. Apparently, this whole town is nuts. I don't have any treats, I told him. He gives me a box of dog treats from behind the counter and says, Call and tell me what happens. I drove back to the campsite and I left the dog treats a few feet from the camper. It was pretty late, so I just went to bed. 
In the morning, I looked outside and the treats were gone, box and all. It was still a little dark, but I went outside. I checked the tires first. They were fine. And then when I stood up and looked around, I was sure I could see something staring at me from the edge of the woods. It was bigger than a man, maybe eight or nine feet. And sure enough, a face like a dog or a wolf. Those tracks must have been from that thing because the feet were huge. It then snarled and bared its teeth at me. And those teeth made me think of a dinosaur's teeth. Yes, those teeth could have done that to the tire. I definitely did not want to make that thing mad, so I slowly packed up and hooked up the trailer and got out of there. I didn't stop at the visitor center, although I thought about that Paul Bunyan guy the whole way out of there. I guess the locals here really do know what's up. I should have known better than to doubt them. At the risk of everybody knowing who I am when they hear this story, I'm going to go ahead and tell it publicly because I think it's worth sharing with a wider audience than just my friends and family. In 2020, following my divorce, I bought a tiny house in the small town of Bradley, South Dakota. It wasn't much, just a one-bedroom, one-bathroom cottage-type home across the alley from an old church, one that had long since quit holding service and started falling apart. Bradley's a very small town with a Mayberry-type feel. Everybody knows everybody. The kids and dogs run the streets freely without anybody bothering them too much. There's even an old woman a couple of blocks over with a pet peacock that runs wild with the kids. When you envision a small, weird little town in the middle of nowhere, it's Bradley, South Dakota. So I wasn't expecting much trouble the day I moved in. In fact, the first few weeks I was there were pretty boring. Nothing at all happened. I spent the time fixing up the house just like I like it, literally, in some cases, sitting and watching the paint dry. It was my tenth night in the house when I first saw the little girl. I was watching TV in the living room and I heard something shuffling around in the hallway. I couldn't imagine what it might be and I thought that maybe one of those free-range kids or dogs had made its way in through my back door. So I got up to check it out. She didn't look like she was more than three or four years old, and she was filthy, covered in dirt from head to toe, and her hair was matted and twisted up in clumps. The only clean thing on her were two streams down her face where the tears had washed the dirt away. She startled me when I first saw her, and then I got concerned. I hadn't seen that kid before, and whoever she was, she wasn't being cared for properly. At least, if her appearance was any indication. I asked her, Honey, what's your name? But she didn't respond. She just kept staring at me blankly, almost fearfully, like she couldn't tell if I was a good person or a bad one. I tried talking to her again and asked, Are you hurt? But she wouldn't tell me. I went back to the living room to get my phone, and when I came back, she was gone. I called the local sheriff and made a report, hoping he'd be able to tell me something or maybe even come out and find the girl. Strangely, he didn't seem at all that surprised by what I was telling him, and he just told me not to worry about it. I went to bed very disturbed, thinking about how strange his reaction was. And then from that point on, the same thing happened three or four times a week. I even tried taking a photo of her with my phone one night, but she ran away the second she saw me pointing it at her. It was like she knew what I was trying to do and didn't want to be identified. Finally, I started asking other neighbors about the little girl and if they knew anything. Most of them acted like I was absolutely crazy. A few of them, though, seemed to know who I was talking about, but acted very much like the sheriff, telling me not to worry, and that they were sure she was just fine. I decided the only way to make it stop was to buy a new lock for the back door. I had long been locking the door, but the house had been there, and they had the same key for who knows how long. A new lock, I thought, might take care of the kid being able to run in and out, especially if she somehow had a copy of the keys or knew how to open that lock. The new lock seemed to work. I didn't see her for about two weeks. And then one night I was startled awake 
wide awake by something cold touching my face. When my eyes opened, the little girl was standing there by my bed and jumped backwards, every bit as frightened as I was when my eyes opened. She took off running out the door quicker than I could get out of bed, and this time I was determined to get an answer about who she was. I wasn't going to continue living this way. I drove down to the sheriff's station myself and asked to speak to him in person. When I told him who I was and that I needed an answer about this kid, he looked reluctant to tell me anything. And then finally, I guess, he decided there was no point in covering it up anymore. He admitted he didn't know her name, who she was, or who she belonged to, but that he had been getting calls about her for years. Now that didn't make any sense to me because she wasn't old enough to have been causing trouble for years. I imagined she was only just finally old enough to turn the doorknob by herself, so I told him I didn't believe a word of what he was saying. If she's been around for years, she's a damn ghost, I said. And that's when he raised his eyebrows at me, and I knew exactly that that is what he was trying to imply. It took a while, but I did finally figure her name out. I visited every library in the Tri-County area, sifting through old newspapers, until I finally came across an article from 1910. A little girl who lived right on the same property I now live on had apparently died of scarlet fever and had been buried in the churchyard behind the house. For days after her death, her mother would sit outside saying she could hear the girl crying. At first, everyone said it was the crazy hallucinations of a grieving mother. Finally, though, the mother insisted that they dig her baby back up to check. Amazingly, they obliged, thinking that one final look at her daughter's body might help her to make peace with the loss. When they did dig the girl up, though, they found her flipped over on her stomach, her hands twisted up in the air, and her poor little fingernails clawed right off into the wooden casket. Apparently, she'd been buried alive and had come back awake some time after. The wailing that her mother had heard was really her. She came back around one more time after I learned who she was. I called her by her name, Rachel, and I told her that I was so sorry that she woke up scared and alone, and that if she had let go of this place, she could pass on and be with her mommy and daddy in the world that comes after this one. She wiped the tears from her eyes, smiled at me, and skipped away. I haven't seen her since. Auburn, New York is a town perfectly situated at the north end of Owasco Lake in the Finger Lakes region of New York State. The area is lush and green in the summer, but has temperatures that fluctuate greatly, from heat and humidity of the summer to its cold, dark days of winter. The town has a long and rich history, being founded in 1793 during the post-revolutionary period of settlement. My father had an old cabin in the area, but for years my brother and I tried to talk him into selling it since no one really went up there anymore. He refused, saying that when we had kids we may want to go up there ourselves and take them with us. Well, eventually we did have kids, but our families never ended up spending time there. So as Dad got older and sicker, the cabin was neglected, and it fell into disrepair. Of course, when Dad died, we had to settle his assets, including the cabin. It was winter, the year we wrapped up his funeral and burial, December 5th of 2012 to be exact, and we decided to take the next week off to go for a drive up to the old property to clean it up and get it ready to sell. Our kids wanted to come, but we decided to leave them home with our spouses so that we would get some closure together. The trip from New York City is long, and we were on the road for what seemed like forever. Winter had already come upstate, so by the time we arrived, it was freezing. Our hotel was in Syracuse, since we didn't want to stay in the cabin itself. We didn't know what the heating situation would be like, since no one had been there for months. We got settled into the hotel and spent that day just resting and recovering from our trip. The next day, Wednesday, we would head to the cabin to start the cleanup. We picked up garbage bags and other cleaning supplies on the way there. It snowed a bit that day, too, so we weren't looking forward to the cleanup. Our appointment with the real estate agency to show the place was on Thursday, so we only had one day to get through all of it. And a long day it was. 
The cabin was a dusty mess with furniture as old as we were. There was even still food in the cupboards from who knows when. And the property itself was a neglected mess from who knows how many winters without maintenance. We had so much work ahead of us that by seven at night, we knew we weren't going to make it back to the hotel. We took another break, and I told my brother I would take the next load of garbage outside. The wind was harsh, but I needed to get outside. The day was not only exhausting physically, but also emotionally. Memories from my childhood were welling up. Memories that I had forgotten even existed. There were patches of trees both behind and in front of the cabin. You couldn't see the neighbor's house or even the road from where I was standing. I was enjoying the quiet and the darkness when I saw something moving around, ahead of me, in one of the patches of trees. At first I thought it was just the fog from my breath mixing with the cold air, but then I could see it more clearly. It was thrashing around a little. I assumed it was a moose, because the only thing I could make out as my eyes adjusted was enormous antlers. But then suddenly the wind blew, and I smelled something putrid. It was like something rotting. It wasn't there when I first stepped outside, so I thought that maybe the animal had just come over and was maybe wounded. Feeling badly, I thought I should check it out. I didn't really trust moose since they're so large. But if it was hurt, I wanted to know if I needed to call somebody. I zipped up my coat and walked toward the tree patch. As I got closer, the smell got worse. I could barely breathe. This thing had to be dying. And that's when the thrashing stopped. Whatever it was knew I was coming over. I stopped, and I waited for this thing to step out to show itself. I turned on the flashlight on my phone, and I held the light towards the ground at first. I didn't want to scare the thing if it was already feeling vulnerable. But that's when I saw a huge claw, not a hoof, step forward into the stream of light. I was shocked by the size, and I couldn't compute what I was looking at when the second claw and a torso stepped into view. Attached to the claw in the long, lanky legs was an open chest, the ribcage visible, and the fur around it bloody. I raised the light slowly up from the feet to see more clearly. It was longer than a moose, probably 15 feet, and standing on all fours in this very creepy way. And that's when I finally noticed its face. I had never seen anything so gruesome. It was literally bones. The skull was gigantic, but it looked human. And the eyes were far back into its sockets, but had just enough flesh to create eyelids that squinted back at me. It was perched on two bony shoulders, and it had this long neck. The teeth were fangs, dripping blood. I heard it make this growling noise like a lion, and at this point it got up on its hind legs and towered over me. I felt like it moved like an animatronic, but it was very, very real. The next thing I remember is that my brother opened the front door and called out to me. It took me out of my shock, and I turned for just a second towards him, and then back to where the creature was. The monster was looking at my brother intently, but then took off with this loud squawking noise into a gallop towards the woods. I stood there, my flashlight still on the empty spot where it had stood. My brother ran over to me to ask what was wrong and what was that noise. He had missed the entire thing, and he hadn't even seen what I had looked at. There were no secrets between me and my brother. I always told him everything so I proceeded to tell him exactly what I saw, all of it. He listened intently, and I could watch him thinking about it, deeply. Eventually he spoke, saying that he thought it was a manifestation of my grief of Dad, or that my mind was on overload from the past week. I was crushed that he didn't actually believe me, that he thought I had just imagined the beast, but I know what I saw was real, and that smell is something I will never forget. I've never smelled anything like it before. I haven't smelled anything like it since. This creature did not just come from my imagination. It was completely real. I've lived on a farm my whole life. Death on a farm is inevitable. So is life. Occasionally, though, you'll have unexplained deaths. This is a story I tell all the time to warn others 
and every bit of it is true. I raise sheep in Montana. My wife and I bought a piece of land with lots of room to grow our family and our business. There was a nice size house and a barn already on it. We built fencing in order to keep predators out. Once we started buying animals at the local farm swaps, we just couldn't seem to stop. It started with sheep, in pairs, different breeds, and that just meant more fencing. And then we got chickens. We built a small chicken coop that connected to the barn. The chickens could roam the yard all day, but they always seemed to put themselves to bed at night. All we had to do was go out and close up the little door when it got dark. Being that we seemed to spend a lot of our weekend mornings at the farm swaps, we got to know a lot of our neighbors. Most of them raised animals, too, and they would tell birth stories, funny stories, and warn each other when predators seemed to be out and about. We beefed up our security by purchasing a dog that we hoped would help protect our livestock as it grew up. He was a great Pyrenees, and if you know anything about them, it's that they are huge. We named him Tuck. My wife and I spoiled Tuck rotten, and he went everywhere with us. He loved riding in the truck. And then when he got big enough, he would jump up in the truck bed, hoping we would take him for a ride. I started leaving the tailgate down, because it's a lifted truck and pretty high up. One summer, it got so unseasonably hot that our chickens started falling over from too much heat. They were passing out. We even lost one to dehydration. We bought them a fan and some misters, but like I said, they roamed most of the time. It was a Monday when we lost the first one. By Thursday, we were down to just 10 from our original 15. Some of them didn't come home at night, and we feared they had died from the heat somewhere. Friday, we woke up and discovered that we'd forgotten to close the hatch to the chicken coop. A few were roaming around in the yard already. We let Tuck out as we went to do morning chores, and he ran to the coop and began frantically barking. When we went to see what was going on, and as we got closer... We saw feathers and bits of something all around the little building. Tuck started whining and ran away. When we got there and looked in, we could see that there was a chicken torn to shreds beside the coop door. It was a horrible sight. What was left of the bird was mangled. My wife had never seen anything like it. Unfortunately, I had. My guess was that a coyote or a wolf had gotten its head in the door and this poor girl was probably the unlucky one close enough to the opening to be grabbed. That's what we thought, until we made a discovery the following night. It was about 10.30, and Tuck started pacing by the glass sliding door. He was whining, and then he began howling, so I grabbed the shotgun, and he and I went out into the night. My wife followed us with a flashlight. The chicken coop is a good hundred yards from the back of the house. Tuck took off like a shot towards it, and he wouldn't listen when I called him back. That's unusual. We heard him growling, and it sounded like he was fighting with something. By the time we got to the coop, Tuck had chased off whatever the predator was. He sniffed around some and headed around the corner to the barn. And then one of the sheep started screaming. We followed Tuck. He must have triggered the motion lights, and that's when we saw it. It was gray and it stood nearly seven feet tall on two legs. Its face was something like a wolf with a long nose, and its chest was broad and rippled with muscles. Also, it was standing upright. The hair on its head ran down its back like a mane, standing up as it snarled at us. The whole barn reeked of wet dog, overpowering the smell of the livestock. I raised my shotgun at it, and that's when Tuck launched at it. I couldn't stop him. That thing tossed our 146-pound dog like he weighed nothing, and then it let out this guttural growl. I took a shot, but I was shaking so badly I missed. The thing jumped up into the livestock pens and burst through the door on the other side of the barn. Tuck ran out the door, trying to head it off. Admittedly, we didn't want to follow. We were too scared. I got outside just in time to see the back end of Tuck jumping into the truck bed. The wolf-like thing was nowhere to be found, so I went over to check on Tuck. I heard whining, and when I tried to look over the tailgate, Tuck grabbed my pant legs by his teeth. He was hiding underneath the truck. 
That's when the creature jumped out of the back of the truck and landed at least ten feet away, already running. I pulled the trigger again, shooting in its direction, but it was running so fast, both on four legs and two. I think I might have hit it this time, but the thing was enormous, and if I did, it didn't hurt it enough to slow it down. Lucky for us, that was the last time we encountered that thing, but you can be sure that we alerted the neighbors, and now we are all looking for it. I know you might all say I'm crazy and that maybe I didn't see what I saw or that I was seeing things because it was so late at night, but my mother did not raise a fool and I know what I saw. I saw it as clear as day. Nobody can change my mind. It was August of 2017 and I had been working the night shift at the drive through for about a year. I hadn't seen anything stranger than a few winos walk through the drive through trying to order like they didn't realize they were not in a car. Those kinds of problems I can handle. But this, this was something else. Although I think it's crazy, we're open 24-7. And on this particular day, I was standing there at the counter and looking out the window. From that window, you can see the interstate on one side and the woods on the other. So I was just standing there looking and daydreaming when I heard this strange noise coming from the edge of the woods. Now you have to understand that there isn't a soul around, let alone a customer, during these super late night shifts. The manager only keeps the place open because it has something to do with franchise obligation and quotas of opening hours. I'm not sure, but the truth is, Nobody is coming for a Beaver D Big Daddy Burger at four o'clock in the morning, period. The manager knows this, but he convinces us to work this shift because it's double time pay, and we usually don't have to do much work while we're there. Seriously, the guys I work with, they cook up about a dozen burgers at the start of the shift, throw them in the steamer, and then they sit around on cardboard boxes playing poker all night. If somebody does come through to buy a burger, they get one that's about as fresh as they are in those wee hours of the morning. So just like every night, the guys were in the back with their cards, and I was working the drive through In the daytime, there are two windows that are working. The first one where people place the order, and then the serving hatch where somebody gives them their food. On these late night shifts, both jobs are me. I take the order and then I wander over to the serving hatch and hand over the food. Most nights, though, I don't need to move from the order counter because nobody orders. So I got it all set up with my own chair and my phone charger so I can watch TV. That night I had forgotten my charger, so I was reading this trashy novel that I had found in the storeroom. And I was just staring around, thinking of not much. But that's when I heard the noise. It was like a crackling sound, like something moving around in the woods, close to the edge of the road and opposite the drive through window. At first, I wondered if it was raccoons, because once in a while they come looking for leftovers in the trash cans. Also, if the raccoons spill over the cans, you know whose job that will be to go clear up the mess. So I leaned out of the booth and over the ledge through the space under the glass to see if I could get a better view of where the sound was coming from, and to check that the trash cans were still upright. At first I didn't see anything. I was about to call out and shoo them away when I saw a shadow in the parking lot. Now I know that when the light's behind you, you can stretch your shadow out and make it look really long or tall or whatever, but that's not what happened here. As soon as I laid my eyes on that shadow, I knew that something was wrong. Now sometimes when I tell people what I saw, they like to say that it was probably just some drunk guy in a wolf suit, or a punk kid playing a prank, or something like that. And I say that's fine, but if that's true, then he must have been some kind of basketball player, or else he was on stilts because I swear to goodness that the thing that the shadow belonged to was at least seven feet tall. And then I saw it. I watched it slowly come out of the woods. At first it was crouched down, kind of like a dog or a bear, 
but then it just stood up. And I don't mean like a bear stands. This was not an animal balancing on its hind legs. This thing stood up because it was used to walking on two legs, walking upright like a man. But I'm telling you, that was no man. Now, I've had some people tell me that it was a Sasquatch or some foolishness about UFOs and aliens, but it was more like a werewolf or a dog or something like that. The way its face jutted out, you know, like its snout or muzzle or whatever it's called. And there were these teeth. It looked like two rows of pointy teeth and hair, just like everywhere. Long, straggly hair that was long on its head and hung down on either side and around its neck. I wanted to scream, to holler to the guys in the back, but I was scared that if I made a sound, it would turn and see me looking at it. There was nothing but a piece of plexiglass between me and the outside of that drive through window, and the glass doesn't even go all the way down. I mean, I had just leaned out a few seconds ago. Some people think it might be reinforced or bulletproof or something, and maybe, maybe at McDonald's or Wendy's, but here, it's just regular old glass. I had these visions of that thing breaking through and lunging for me, and in my visions, those hands that it has were hands, proper hands, not paws like an animal, but hands like a human being's but then longer with these claws on the ends of the fingers. I just thought about them breaking through the glass and grabbing at me. All of a sudden it froze and went completely still, and then it raised its head like it was smelling the air, tasting it, looking for a scent. I knew right then that I had to get out of there, to move before it noticed me. So really slowly I backed away from the window taking these tiny little footsteps and never taking my eyes off of that thing. As soon as my hand reached the door, I pulled the fire alarm and the whole place went up with sirens and the high-pitched wailing of the alarm. I turned and I screamed. By the time the guys from the back ran outside to look, the thing was gone. Nothing but an empty parking lot, some dark trees, and the interstate. I knew the guys wouldn't believe me, but I didn't care. You might not believe me now, but it's the truth, and I tell you something else that's true, that right there was the last time I ever worked a night shift. Not just there, but anywhere. I promised myself that that was the last of the night shift for me. I've been listening to your channel for about a month, and I finally decided to write in with this story of my own. I actually found your channel because of what my boyfriend and I experienced, and I'd love to know what you and your listeners think has been happening in our apartment. My boyfriend Brian and I live in an older duplex in a residential area of Connecticut. The surrounding homes are all older, and there's an old mill that's been turned into loft apartments right down the street. Basically, we are surrounded by history, and the architecture is beautiful. We got lucky with our apartment. It's in an older brick building with 10-foot-high ceilings and a lot of character. We live on the first floor. That'll be important later on. About eight months into living here, Brian and I were prepping for Halloween. Both of us grew up in big families, and we have a handful of nieces and nephews, so we get really excited for this holiday, and we go all out. Pumpkins, candy, scary soundtrack playing... We were finishing up a TV show at around 6 o'clock, and it was just starting to get dark. So we decided to turn the porch light on and hang out in the kitchen area. Now to get into our apartment, you have to walk up a small porch, open the front door, which is always unlocked, and then you enter a small foyer. To the left is a staircase that goes up to our neighbor's apartment. And then our door is immediately across from the front door, about 4 or 5 feet right next to the stairs. Finally, on the left is another door that goes down to the basement. Brian and I checked out the basement when we first moved in since it was offered as a storage space, and it's huge. It's well-kept, but definitely old with a lot of nooks and crannies. There are probably at least four separate lights down there, and like the rest of the building, it's all brick. The basement door has a latch on it, 
one of those complicated ones that slides and then fits into a notch. We always keep it locked unless the landlady gives us a heads up that a technician is coming. So on Halloween night, we were having a beer and chatting in the kitchen when we heard the front door open to the foyer. Well, that was a little weird since our neighbors were all home upstairs and the trick-or-treaters usually knock. I walked over and I looked through the peephole to see if a trick-or-treater had invited themselves in, but no one was in the hallway. Thinking it might just be a draft, we went back to chatting and hanging out, keeping an eye out for families walking by. Eventually, we heard a group out on the porch, and we stepped out of the apartment to the front door. But as we did so, we noticed that the basement door was open. Not much, just an inch or two. But that was weird. It hadn't been opened when I'd looked out the peephole just a few minutes earlier. So Brian shut the door, and we handed out candy, chatting with the kids' parents for a little bit before they went on their way. I gave the basement door another glance as we went back into the apartment, but I didn't say anything. A few more groups came and went, and then we had a bit of a lull. At around 7.30, we decided to take the dog out for a quick walk, and we locked up. It takes about 20 minutes to walk around the cul-de-sac, and we stopped to chat with other neighbors, so we got back at about 8 o'clock. When we walked into the hallway, the basement door was open again. I asked Brian if he'd locked it. He said he did. He texted one of the upstairs neighbors asking if they had gone down there. We got a pretty quick answer that no, they hadn't left their apartment at all. The neighbor Andy made a joke that maybe it was a ghost, but then quickly said it was probably just trick-or-treaters being weird. We tried to brush it off and we had two more groups of kids come by before we turned off the porch light and packed it in for bed. Brian was being a little weird and he wanted to check the basement door again. I scoffed but was nervous. And when he looked through the peephole, the basement door was completely open. It was actually open so wide that it was blocking our door and Brian couldn't see into the hallway. Both of us were on edge. We opened our door. I had a heavy flashlight in hand just in case and decided that we had to go down to make sure nobody was in the basement. We live in a safe area, but we were thinking that maybe somebody had randomly come into the apartment. That would be weird, but the door isn't actually locked just latched. Brian and I went down and very, very slowly checked the basement. We turned on every light and shone the flashlight into the corners, but it was empty. And then when we got back up, I latched the door myself and jiggled it to make sure it was closed tightly. This time, Brian texted our neighbor Andy to give him another heads up that the door had been opened again. Since it was Halloween, I tried to shrug it off as just a weird night with teens messing around or something, and eventually got to sleep. Brian had to wake up early the next morning to go to work. He came back into the bedroom and woke me up to show me that the basement door was open again. Someone had opened it in the night, sometime after 11, when we went to bed. He locked it hurriedly, and I agreed to reach out to the landlady. She was concerned, but could only offer to put an actual lock on the door. She's supposed to be coming later this week to do so. Since Halloween, every single night, the basement door gets opened, no matter how tightly we latch it or what we put in front of it. Brian actually put a chair up against the handle one night, and it was still open the next morning. We have no idea what's going on, but maybe our neighbor is right. Maybe it actually is a ghost. Like I said, we live in a historic neighborhood. We've checked several times, and we haven't seen or heard a person going down there but there's no way for the latch to just come undone by itself. Hopefully, when our landlady installs a lock, this all stops. If it doesn't, I'll write in with an update. Fingers crossed that if it is a ghost, at least it's a friendly one. I've been a park ranger going on six years now at Yellowstone National Park. I'm a backcountry ranger. As a backcountry ranger, you need to have experience with horseback riding, backcountry skiing, avalanche safety, to name a few. Another requirement of the job is having the ability to hike 20 miles at a time and work for 24-hour shifts. It's a physically demanding job and not for the faint of heart. We're well-trained in extreme conditions like extreme cold, deep snow, and wet conditions. This is my second year as a backcountry ranger. 
I love Yellowstone, and it's always been a dream of mine to work here. There are over 3 million people a year that visit Yellowstone, and there are over 2 million acres of wildlife that we need to manage and where visitors can explore by camping, hiking, fishing, and sightseeing. The park is home to grizzly bears, wolves, elk, and many other species of animals. Some species, at least as far as I've experienced, are not documented. This brings me to my next point. As a backcountry ranger, you'll encounter wildlife on a daily basis. It's not unusual to see herds of bison or elk while you're hiking. You need to be constantly aware of your surroundings and be aware at all times. There have been instances where people have gotten too close to wildlife and have been seriously injured or even killed. It's our job to make sure that visitors are safe and that they enjoy their experience in the park. We also work with the other rangers in different departments to make sure that the park is running smoothly and efficiently. I've had several experiences with visitors who claim to see something that would be deemed supernatural or mysterious. In August of 2018, I responded to a couple who were hiking the Cascade Trail, and they said that they saw a giant bird that was at least 10 feet tall with a wingspan of 20 feet. They described it as being all black with red eyes. I don't know what to make of their story, but I took it seriously, and I filed a report. I didn't see anything unusual when I went to the location, but there have been other reports of sightings of similar creatures in the park. I don't know what to believe, but I do know that there are many things in this world that we don't understand. In June of that same year, another couple reported seeing a tall man walking in the woods near the Cascade Trail. They said that he was at least eight feet tall and was wearing all black. That couple was so scared that they ran back to their car and drove off. They said that this man, or creature, came out from the woods and emerged onto the trail. They said the thing reeked and made these guttural grunting sounds. They were terrified when they called it in. The most disturbing of these occurrences is one that I experienced myself on the North Rim Trail. I was performing trail maintenance because there had been some recent flooding, and the trail was washed out in places. I was working by myself, and I heard something walking on the trail towards me. The section of the trail was closed, so there shouldn't have been anybody on it. I got up to see what it was, and I saw a large figure walking towards me. The thing was at least eight feet tall, very muscular, long black hair. It was later in the day, and this was a heavily wooded area of the trail, so I couldn't see it very well. It was walking towards me, and with every step it took, the ground shook. It was definitely not human. As it got closer, it looked dog-like, but much larger. And then when it was about 30 feet away from me, it stopped and just stared at me. We looked at each other for what felt like a very long time, and then it turned around and walked back the way it came. I was so shaken by the experience that I didn't even finish my work that day. I reported it all to my supervisor, and he said that there had been other reports of similar sightings in the park, but he had been instructed to not share those. I don't know what this creature was, but I know that it wasn't human. I spoke with some other backcountry rangers, and they said they had similar experiences, either from visitor reports or themselves directly. The ranger who was assigned the same North Rim Trail maintenance duties the previous day told me he felt like he was being watched all day, but he thought nothing of it and didn't say anything until now. Although he didn't see anything, he said the hair on the back of his neck stood up the entire time he was working. There have been other reports of sightings of large animals, creatures in the park that don't fit into any known category. I don't know what to make of those reports, but I do know that there's something out there that none of us understands. I encourage people to come to Yellowstone and experience its beauty for themselves, but I have to caution them, be aware of your surroundings. Be safe. You might not know what you might encounter while you're here. I was doing some field work near the Centennial Valley in Montana. I was in college at the time going for a degree in conservation. 
I found a summer job testing water quality in various areas across the valley. Some days were easy, some were hard. It all depended on the location of the samples I needed to collect. Centennial Valley is big on conservation. It lies just west of Yellowstone and is a massive migration field for local wildlife. The valley itself is made up of mostly grasslands and wetlands, but it's surrounded by mountains on both sides. The lower part of the mountains are covered in thick forests. It's some rough country out there. Beautiful, but very dangerous if you don't know your way around. We were required to make notes on any animal encounters that we had while working in the field. There was an ongoing study of the wildlife populations in the valley, so they wanted everyone working out there to record what they could. We didn't have to note birds or marmots, just the big things like deer, elk, bison, bears, moose, wolves. I didn't have a whole lot of animal encounters that summer. I saw a few elk early in the year and a brown dot off in the distance that looked like a grizzly bear, but I wasn't close enough to be certain. I was extra cautious about bears in the area and moose. I was terrified of running into a moose. I was naive to think that bears and moose were the most dangerous things in the valley. There's something else living out there, though, that didn't make it into my field notes. I don't think anyone would believe me, so I've kept it quiet until now. It was towards the end of the season. I was collecting water samples from a river that ran through the valley. It was an area only accessible by ATV. This particular river was a main water source for several species of wildlife in the nearby area, so animal sightings weren't uncommon. But as soon as I reached the river that day, I smelled something rotten. I knew right away that it was a carcass of some kind but I couldn't see it right away. They made all of us take a bear safety course before we began working in the valley. Part of that course told us to stay very far away from any animal carcasses in case a bear was guarding the area. I didn't bother with the water samples. I started to turn the ATV around, and that's when I saw the carcass. It was an elk. Its antlers were peeking out of the tall grass. I had to drive right past it to get the ATV turned around. But it was strange. Its body looked fresh, but it smelled like it had been dead for weeks. There weren't any wounds that I could see on the animal. It was skinny, but other than that, its body looked fine. Usually bears rip into the lower abdomen first. There are fewer bones in there. But this animal was intact. And then I saw its head. All of the skin had been removed. It was only a skull, but it was still attached to the body of the elk. I didn't know what to think of it, but I knew I had to get out of there. I reported the carcass to the lead ranger overseeing my project, and the area was closed for a few weeks. This was to keep us safe from any potential bear encounters. But like I said, that wasn't the real danger out there. Two days later, I was sent to a different location. This area was a marshy wetland. It was about 35 miles away from where I had found the elk carcass. I hiked to the edge of where the marshy area began to get my water samples when I was overcome by the smell of something dead. Now what were the odds that I would stumble upon two animal carcasses in less than a week? I slowly backed away from the edge of the water, scanning for any signs of predators in the area. I didn't see anything, nor did I see any tracks on the way in. I had about 50 yards to hike back to the ATV, and it felt like the longest 50 yards of my life. I had a can of bear spray with me, but I knew that that wouldn't stop a bear if it was defending a meal. And then out of the corner of my eye, I saw elk antlers in the grass. It was the same thing I had seen two days prior. A dead elk with no visible wounds. No signs of predation, except for the skull. All the skin had been removed from the skull. If I didn't know better, I would say that it was the exact same animal I had seen before but that was impossible. Both animals were dead and separated by a good 35 miles. I finally reached the ATV and got out of there as quickly as was safe. It was an odd experience, but I pushed it to the back of my mind. It bothered me, but I tried not to think about it. What was out there skinning the heads of these elk and leaving their bodies intact? And why haven't any predators found them? I'd get my answer about a week later. 
I was sent out to a river on the far side of the valley. It was the same story. As soon as I got there, I smelled that rotting smell, and I just knew. I don't know how, but I knew. I knew it wasn't two dead elk that I found. This was some sort of a creature, and it was following me. Like an idiot, I yelled out to it. I told it I knew it was out there, and I knew it wasn't dead, even though it had been pretending to be. And then I heard something rustling in the grasses behind me. It was the creature. It had been lying down, no doubt pretending again to be dead. I couldn't see any eyes in the black holes of its skull, but I still knew that it was looking right at me. It was the most horrifying thing I've ever seen. Its body was that of an emaciated elk, but it had no skin on its head. It somehow looked both alive and dead at the same time. Its legs were spindly, and the way it moved was very odd. It was like the creature was about to collapse with every step, but I knew that if it reached me, it could probably kill me. It looked at me, it lowered its head, and it blew air out of its exposed nasal passages. I bolted to the ATV and spun it around as fast as I could. The thing had been following me. I knew that much. I don't know what its plans were, but I knew that they weren't anything good, and I didn't intend to stay and find out. The creature didn't follow me out that I could see. I stopped doing field work that day, and I never saw anything like it ever again. I have nightmares about it sometimes, about what it wanted to do to me, and why it didn't kill me when I first discovered it playing dead in the grass. I mean, I had taken a long enough look at it that it could have jumped up and reached me with no problem. I don't suppose I'll ever get answers to any of these questions, and maybe it's just better that way.